All right, here's the transition state. Now, the transition state is not something that we can isolate in the lab. We're not going to be able to pull something out of the beaker and call this the transition state because this is very fleeting. Notice how unstable this is. If we're a little bit to the left here, we would slide back down. So if these, if these things collide with just a little bit too little energy, they would get to here and they would slide back down. Or if they collide with just a little bit too much energy, they get to here and slide down this direction. So it's almost impossible that they would just be resting up here. So for all practical purposes, you can never isolate the transition state. It's just theoretical. It's something that phys um, chemists think about to understand how the reaction is happening. Here's a reaction where we're going from this starting material to these products. So here's what the NOCl looks like over here, and here's what the NO and the Cl looks like uh, over here. So what would the transition state look like? Well, notice that what's happening in this reaction is that the chlorine is breaking off from the NO. It started with the chlorine attached to the NO, and then in the product, the chlorine is completely broken off from the NO. So the transition state, I guess, would look something like this. To, uh, to write what the species look like at the different points. So here's how we would write that here. We could say we started with two of these NOCl molecules. So here's two of the NOCl molecules. And then we end up with two NO molecules and a chlorine molecule. So I wrote that over here, two NOs and a chlorine. So what's the transition state going to look like? Well, in the transition state, the chlorine is kind of halfway broken off from the nitrogen. It hasn't completely broken off or it would be a product. So notice how I drew this as a, as a dot and not as a dash to show that this bond has partially broken. The chlorine has partially broken off from the nitrogen, which takes energy. That's what the activation energy is doing, breaking that bond. And also, it's going to start forming a bond with this chlorine. So I should put dots down here as well to show that it's starting to form a bond with this other chlorine. That's why we're starting with two equivalents of NOCl, so that eventually the two chlorines can break off and match up with each other, which will eventually give us this, two NOs without chlorine and two chlorines attached to each other. So the dots here can be used conventionally to show bonds that are in the middle of breaking or bonds that are in the middle of forming. All right, so this is the point where we've just added barely enough energy to start really breaking these bonds and forming this bond. This is the point where we finish putting in energy, and now from now on, we're going to start getting energy out. If we get to this point, then reaction will keep going. So this is how we could draw this transition state. Now again, you could never isolate this in the lab. This is just a theoretical picture of what things look like in, in the very middle of the reaction. All we can isolate are the starting materials and the products. All right, but you might be asked to draw transition states. This is the way that would look. All right, so what would the reaction profile look like for a exothermic reaction? What would the reaction profile look like for an endothermic reaction? Starting with the old and the products both. Like this? But the transition state still has to be higher than everybody. There's always a hump in the center that's the transition state. So this is still the starting materials, this is still the products, and this is still the transition state. So label the delta H. Where does the delta H start? Good. So here would be the delta H. Delta H is positive because we're moving up for an endothermic reaction. So who has the greater activation energy, forward or reverse? Forward now has the bigger activation energy. Here's the activation energy for the forward reaction. And here we have a small activation energy for the reverse reaction. So we would expect that here the equilibrium would favor the reverse reaction. Because it's easy for the products to get back into being the starting materials. But the starting materials are kind of stuck. It's hard to go over here. So this would be an equilibrium that would tend to favor the starting materials. Um, all right, so here's something important that we haven't talked about. So if we increase this hump, how would that be observed in the lab? When we increase the hump, how do we observe that? 
Yeah, it changes the rate. Um, let's go back and put that in over here. So this would be what happens if the activation energy went up, for example. Uh, we would go, say, from here to here. Uh, maybe it's way more sense to think about the activation energy being decreased. This would be the activation energy being decreased, going from here to here. Smaller activation energy means a smaller hump, which means a bigger rate, because it means a bigger K. We saw that from the Arrhenius equation. Um, a smaller EA means a bigger K from the Arrhenius equation. Um, but it doesn't change the equilibrium. The equilibrium only depends on the delta H, not on the activation energy. The equilibrium only depends on comparing the starting materials and the products. It only changes the rate. Wait, you just said equilibrium only depends on the delta H? Right, it doesn't depend on the activation energies. That's basically because when you decrease this activation energy, it has the same effect on the forward activation energy as on the reverse activation energy. So those cancel each other out, and there's no effect ultimately on the equilibrium. It's going to be easier here for the forward reaction to go, but it's also going to be easier for the reverse reaction to go. So the equilibrium doesn't change, but we're going to get to the equilibrium faster because it's easier to get over this hump. So this doesn't change the destination, it changes how quickly we're going. It's like, suppose that um, you usually uh, get to New York by driving. Well, that would take you a long time. And then you decide to get to New York by flying. Well, that hasn't changed your destination, it just got you there faster. Decreasing the activation energy doesn't change the destination, it just gets you, the destination is equilibrium. You just get there faster um, by changing the rate. So it's important to know what does change and what does not change um, in these reactions. So the activation energy is related to the rate. And the delta H is related to equilibrium. That's going to be tested a lot in the course. Activation <laughs> energy is related to kinetics, which is the rate. And delta H is related to thermodynamics, which is the equilibrium. So the kinetics and the thermodynamics are different. Uh, okay, same deal over here. For example, this reaction here is endothermic. But that doesn't mean that it's slow. It could have a very small hump. And you could get to equilibrium quite quickly. It's just that the equilibrium doesn't lie very far forward. So just because an e a problem um, uh, has, uh, just because a reaction is very favorable doesn't mean it's very fast. And just because a reaction is unfavorable doesn't mean it's slow. Um, those are different things. Um, so how can we calculate the um, delta H? What would be the delta H for this reaction? If the forward activation energy was 100 and the reverse was 150, what would be the delta H? The difference. You can't see that from the graph. The delta H is the difference between the two activation energies, although I didn't label this up. Well, I've drawn a bunch of different curves here, so let me go back to what I'm starting to make this kind of messy. But um, if this activation energy is 100 and this is 150, uh, well, this delta H, you can see, is the difference between this distance and this distance. This is something I think your instructor mentioned in class. The delta H equals the difference between the two activation energies. This equation makes sense. We almost just kind of proved that with this simple picture on the board here. 